Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Can you hear me? Okay. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, welcome again to, an, uh, we're going to have a very interesting show. As you know, um, when the legislature basically sort of folds up and sort of uh, for, for that particular session, we normally got, we've had Rod Monroe doing the job over here, Senator Monroe doing the job of just giving us a brief overlook of what uh, what has transpired in the, in the during that particular session. As you know, uh, it's some, sometimes it's tough to get access to, but uh, they're out there doing the work. We've elected these folks, but it still is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Sometimes we question that at times, but but the fact of the matter is that's what it is. Well, we're fortunate today to have uh, someone else who's going to be sitting in this place, and, and I'm, I'm fortunate because of this person and I, we have some similar kinds of background, and I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, Rep State Representative Dennis Richardson. Uh, he's Jackson and Josephine County. He's from District Number 4, okay? And uh, we're going to spend some time with, uh, I'm going to say Dennis. Okay, yeah, please Dennis. do. And, uh, and we're going to spend some time with Dennis, and he's going to give us an overview of of what he uh, was involved in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, at the, at the last legislature, and kind of like give us a little overview in terms of where, where should we go from here. But before we go into that, I'm going to hey, welcome Dennis. Appreciate nice that. Nice to be with Okay, you. fantastic. You notice we're donning, we're donning Vietnam caps here, both of us. In fact, it looks like it's about the same deal. It, it is, and it's it coincidental. Isn't that something? Both of us, same, same. Wow, <laughs> that's huge. Wow. Well, the interesting thing about that is that um, we have sort of similar backgrounds. I, I noticed in, in his resume uh, that um, he also was in California. I was in California when I joined the Marine Corps. Uh, he was in California when he joined the Army. That's right. And we both went to Vietnam. I thought that was interesting, too. And he came to Oregon. And uh, there was a quote there that I thought was very interesting in terms of getting in, involved in, in public life. Uh, that was a quote about uh, from Benjamin Franklin that I noticed in his re in, in your resume, Benjamin, and, uh, uh, Dennis. It says that uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin, who believed that a person's that a person's first fifty years of life should be spent learning, earning, and raising a family, and their last fifty years should be dedicated to giving back to society in the form of public service. Again, another similarity. <laughs> Because that's basically what I've been doing here in the in this particular area, in the Portland metropolitan area, and you've been doing it there in in your particular area, which is really great, raising a family and the whole nine yards. So, I'm really excited to have you on the show. I really do. I really am. I mean, so I want to make sure that I let the public know that uh, we've got some commonalities here. Well, that's good. You know, one thing that I don't know how large your family is, but uh, my wife and I we've been married 40 years. We had eight daughters, and they each had a brother. Wow. It was the same brother. Though. Oh, is that right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it was, so there's nine all together. Wow. But I'll tell you what, uh, to get prepared for politics, yes. if you have a large family. Yes. You have, if you have five teenage daughters at once, you got you have to have a thick skin. Yes. you got to negotiate. Yes. Yes. You have to be able to be organized. Yes. Yes. I'll tell you, just, having the, just dealing with transportation and food and entertainment mm -hmm. and schedules mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. that many kids mm -hmm. means you have, to be, you have to have plans. Well, I, we had 12 grandkids. Oh, well, you know, four guys, wonderful. four guys, my wife and I. So it's kind of interesting. It's a very interesting piece. But you know, the other thing, too, I was going to ask you to spend a little time. You moved to a small town. I, I thought that was very interesting how you did that. And you got very, very much involved. You got you to practice. You still have to practice, right? I shut it down two years ago. You so I'm a retired a small town attorney. Okay, okay. But you went there. What, what was some of the exploit during that particular time when you, when you were? I noticed you had one little event about the... Uh, well, you know, just getting there was, was kind of interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, in law school... Uh, you're basically being taught by elitists, you know, okay. by law professors yeah. who've been at the peak of their career with large firms and large cities, or they've been judges or whatever. And so now they get into law school and they kind of make you think that if you're going to be anything, you're going to go with a large law firm in a large city. Mm -hmm. And if you're not so good, you'll right. be in a medium. And if you're not so good, maybe a larger firm in a smaller community. And if you're at the very bottom, you hang out your shingle in a small city <laughs> or a right, small right. town. Right, right, right. And so... Uh, one day, I mean, I, I wrote on the law review, and I was the head of moot court, which is trial trial preparation. So mm -hmm. I was busy. I was building my resume. I published articles while I was in law school. I was getting ready for this law firm, you know, the big firm somewhere. Yes. And this guy came by my office, and he, he was just flying. You know, he was flying high. He had a telegram in his hand. He said, Dennis, I got the job. I said, 
what job? He said, in Cleveland. I've got a job with a Cleveland. large firm in Cleveland. I said, you ever been to Cleveland in the winter? He said, no, but this guy, they got their own cafeteria. He said, he said so is your family from Cleveland? No, they're all from California. It's like, Cleveland. And so he just kind of drifted on past, as excited as could be. So I go home and I talk to my wife. And I say, Kathy, uh, do we want to go to Cleveland? She goes, no. I said, but all we're doing is preparing to go with a large firm in a large city, whether it's New York or Detroit or Cleveland or mm -hmm. Los Angeles. We're going to send those resumes out. We'll get hired. They're going to hire five or 10 people. I'll be there till 11 o'clock every night competing to see who's going to be made a partner. I won't see the family. Is that really what we want? And so we decided that wasn't what we wanted. I mean, we, at that point, we had three kids. We had twins and a little girl, and I had a son by a prior marriage, so three of them living mm -hmm. with us, though. And we didn't want that for our family. Mm -hmm. And so we started looking around the Western United States. We made a list of things that we wanted. And ultimately, and I could go into detail about all yeah, the places yeah, we looked yeah. at, but finally we decided on Medford. So I, came, I moved to Medford and uh, opened up my own practice, hung out my shingle. Wow. I, the first day, I mean, all I had was energy yeah, and time. Yeah, I had wow, no, wow. no yeah. customers, you know, no clients. Yeah. But they started coming. I'll tell you what, I was so surprised because they wanted to go with a, a young attorney. Yes. I, I don't know why. I didn't know anything. <laughs> it's like going with a brand new surgeon. Yeah. I think I'd like to have one of the few years experience, <laughs> yeah, right, right. you know. But uh, people came in. I went to other lawyers and got business from them. You know, I said, you must, oh, have, you working, uh, yeah. you must have cases that are just a headache for right, you. Right, right. Let me take them over. And Entrepreneur work them. spirit. I did that. Uh, got involved in local community. Uh, at one point, uh, you kind of mentioned that you were referring to it. There was a... A, a, a porn shop, an adult mm, right. video store mm -hmm. that wanted to move into the neighborhood right in Central Point near the school, near the churches. And, you know, it was it, it was gearing up for this big fight, you know, mm -hmm. about how we're going to stop him. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a second, let's go talk to this guy. Mm -hmm. So I went with another guy, talked to him, and I said, here's the situation. You know, you're going to go forward. All your neighbors are going to hate you. You're going to be the, the least uh, um, acceptable neighbor in the whole neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you know, you can do the right thing and go to another place where there's not churches and families mm -hmm. and kids walking by and all that. Yeah. He thought it over, withdrew his application, and left because we dealt with it in a, in a friendly, conciliatory mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. instead of immediately pulling out the guns and going mm -hmm. to court. Right, right, we need right. more of that. Right. It worked in and it works. That, that kind of attitude, I think, has worked well in the legislature. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, look, let's get in another area. I'm thinking about your Vietnam. We've been, we've done in these hands. I'm sure they're anxious <laughs> to get a sense of, you know, where, where did you, where, you know, where did you serve in Nam? You, you were in Nam, yeah. right? Yeah, I was. Uh, As a helicopter instructor? I, I was a helicopter, helicopter pilot, pilot right. in I-Corps. Right. So there, in South right. Vietnam, you had four exactly. divisions. Yep. So I was up in the top one. I think you were, yeah, too. Exactly. Right. So yeah. I was out of Chu Lai. Uh, which was south, a couple hour flight, an hour flight from uh, Da Nang, where yeah, you were at, exactly Marble where Mountain. Was Marble Mountain, exactly. So I flew as far as Da Nang and as down south of Duck Phu. Uh, four four months out of the time, I was a Nighthawk pilot, and that that was a uh, different kind of flying because two ships would go out to the north and two to the south, and these two two teams would go out at dusk and look for trouble until dawn, and um, it was exciting but you, you get addicted to adrenaline yes yes and so, and so we were 46 hueys and what were these were hueys okay and okay. there's two ships a high ship and a low ship okay. the low ship had a very very bright spotlight mm -hmm. like two million candle power and a guy on that and then right next to him was a guy on a minigun mm -hmm. a minigun's like an electric gatling gun that can shoot up to 3600 rounds a minute mm -hmm. so if every fifth bullet is a tracer it looks they're going out so fast it looks like it's electricity right, going right. down to the ground right. and then on the other side was a 50 caliber machine gun and then a regular 7.62 mm -hmm. machine gun so they go out they turn off all their lights except this really bright light and just be looking around mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the north vietnamese army the nva and the Viet Cong were taught don't shoot at the light. Don't shoot at the light. What they <laughs> because, <do? laughs> but they couldn't resist. They say, I can get that. Yes. So they would shoot at the light, and so you'd see muzzle flashes, and then the guy in the minigun, the minigun would immediately put down suppressive fire, and and it was it was very effective, kind of dangerous because you are a target, right. and there's nobody's come after you right. other than you know the the high ship right. I was flying the chase ship, and so uh, we would do that every so often. There'd be a situation where 
you'd be very dark outside mm -hmm. and there would be a whole bunch of troops that were going across and all of a sudden you'd start seeing muzzle flashes from mm -hmm. all over so the low ship would turn out their light I would go up and drop flares all of a sudden we just put out these flares on parachutes mm -hmm. that would light up the whole area like daylight wow. and it was like taking a rock off of an anthill mm -hmm. because all of a sudden it's daylight and it's oops and people scurrying around and anyway it was um it was kind of, there was this as you recall it's kind of yeah, an unwritten yeah, yeah, rule over there yeah. that that the americans could go out from dawn to dusk mm -hmm. and do their thing mm -hmm. and then from dusk till dawn they, they, they pull into your fire bases they, and the, the the vc and the nba were running things and so to be out at night during their time right exactly was uh was exciting time. You know, it's interesting because the you know, same thing with me because I, I slept well at night at times when Puff, remember that? Yeah. Puff oh, yeah. The Magic Dragon, C-130s, remember those C-130s? Loaded with armor. I tell you, boy, yeah. uh, big time. I mean, that was the night that I, well, we slept real well there that night, yeah. but we were hit pretty well quite a bit there at, at, at yeah. the helicopter base. That's been good. Well, that's great. That's great. So when, you, when did you leave there? I was there all of 1971, mm -hmm. left about October. Actually, I left in a couple of months early they were shutting down Chulai. Mm -hmm. And it had been a Marine base before, yeah. and then it was an Army base right. while I was there. And then they were shutting it down because they were slowing the war down. And so they said, uh, well, Dennis, do you want to become a commissioned officer, a career, or do you want to get out early? I said, let me think about that. I'll get out early. You know, I'm done. You know? <laughs> Sound like me. <laughs> but it, it was, wasn't like it me. tough, though? Oh, it was. Because it you're, really in that, was. you're in that situation, and then you fly get home, I was out at Fort Lewis, Washington. Right. They, you know, de roast me. Mm -hmm. they, they, they check you out. Right. You get sent home, and now you put on your old clothes. You're in your old bedroom, mm -hmm. and it's like three days there. It's like this was just a dream. I mean, yeah. it, because nobody really was yeah. aware of it. I mean, they, they watched the news, mm -hmm. but it was mm -hmm. they were disconnected mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people were unhappier over there to begin with. And I mean, we didn't ask to go there. Yeah, you know, exactly, it was the exactly, way it was. Exactly. But. You know, you learn a lot from yeah. those experiences. You learn a lot about yourself. Yes, you do. And yes, how you, you do. how you respond under pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, I might share with you my how I got here to a certain degree because uh, I yeah. because there I was in now I'm 68, 69. You know, doing yeah, Tet during, during Tet Offensive. That was a kind incredible. of a tough little area during that particular time. That's when I arrived in there. But but anyway, um, uh, I was told that um, after about a year or so, I I, uh, I was told that I was going to go on recruiting duty. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, "Well, you're going to be going to the." Um, Pacific North. Well, you're going to be going to wa near Washington. Yeah. I thought it was the state of, you know, it was Washington back east. Yeah, right. Washington, yeah. D.C. Okay. Because <laughs> a lot of my buddies were going back that way. I said, no, it's the Pacific Northwest. I said, where is that? I said, Bruce, get, gonna get the, get the globe. So I went and got the globe and I looked at it. It said, Pacific Northwest. I had never been no, to the Pacific I Northwest know, before in my life. But, but I've been long, long and short of it all, it's been great. I mean, I've, I stayed here, met my wife here, and yes. and we've just lived here, and it's been just fantastic. So, so we, we, we've it's got some great comparison. Place. That's kind of neat. Oregon's a great state. Yeah. It, you know, being in the legislature for ten years has been uh, some of the best times and some of the worst. Mm -hmm. Best because you see how things work, and y y you learn that it's kind of like the introduction. Our system of government doesn't work unless you've got people that are willing to leave their homes that and these people need to have a skill set mm -hmm. and they need to go serve i mean from the time of washington leaving mount vernon mm -hmm. or jefferson leaving monticello they didn't have to leave mm -hmm. but they chose to do that because it was their duty and they had a skill set that's helped set our country on a course to be the greatest nation in the world and i mean i'm i'm no washington or jefferson but to leave the law firm and my practice and my mm -hmm. family and so forth. Now, most of the kids were married off by then yeah, and, right. and, and, you know, that, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And great, we have great grandkids. That's, I mean, wonderful grandkids, mm -hmm. not great grandkids yeah, right, yet. Right, 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 right. But to, to be in the legislature and to be part of the process and to have the philosophy where I'm not looking for PERS, I'm not mm -hmm. looking for a job, I'm, don't, I'm not looking for, you know, some easy situation in the future. It's about what's best for Oregon. Mm -hmm. And so when special interests or lobbyists come in and they say, hey, I need your help on this bill, I can say, you know, how is this good for Oregon? Mm -hmm. And then if it's a little one-sided, I say, so who's on the other side of the bill? Mm -hmm. And what would they say if they're here? Mm -hmm. And if it's an important bill, I'll call in the lobbyists on the other side, and between the two, you get a pretty good idea of what's really going on, and you can make a decision based on what's best for the state, not 
what is politically in mm -hmm. the best interest. Mm -hmm. Because the worst can happen is I'd be home with my family. Yes, you right, know what exactly. I mean? So then, is it working? What do you think? I mean, you've been how, how long have you been now? In the, in the Ten right? years. Ten years. What yeah. do you think from the when you first got involved to the process up to date? Is it working for the people? You know, what it, do you think? I'll tell you, it it's disappointing in a lot of ways. I mean, I. I was a planner, right? And with my size family, you got to have a plan, you, you right? You have to have a plan. If you're a, a, a pilot, you don't start a flight without a flight plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Vietnam, people's lives depended on pilots that had a plan. And then I got in the legislature and I thought, well, a great state like Oregon, it's yeah. got to have a plan. plan. Yes. There's no plan. Ten years later, <laughs> there's still no plan. No plan. They talk about a ten year plan, but it's empty words. What really you've got is a two year situation. I. In, in 2011, in 2011, there was 30 Republicans and 30 Democrats, right? right, right. And so we negotiated on how to handle that. We decided we'd have co-chairs. So I was a co-chair of Ways and Means. Representative Buckley, a Democrat from Ashland, was the other co-chair. Mm -hmm. And Richard Devlin, a Democrat from the Senate, yeah, yeah. was also from there. Missouri. So the three of us are in charge of the state budget. Mm -hmm. And so this puts me down in the alcoves in the yes. basement of, yep. of the Capitol behind what used to be smoke-filled rooms, you know, where... The budgets are all crafted, and I'm in the middle of that, and I'm hmm. seeing how it how it's done, and I can tell you some great stories about <laughs> that. But one thing that I remembered was one of the co-chairs said, "Hey, I'm just all we just need to do is get through this session." I said, "Get through the session? <laughs> are, is the world end of the world coming? I mean, aren't we coming back in 2013 and 2015? Right. We should be making these decisions." based on what the plan is the for plan, our state. Plan, right, exactly. but it's only about getting through the next right, two years. Right. And so that explains why we have so many problems because we have more money coming in, it's let's spend it. Mm. And then when you have very little money, it's oh, what are we gonna do? I mean, it's feast or feathers. But had you had yeah. a plan. But, but if you had a plan, right. you'd, be, you'd be evaluating Specifics. every, you'd be evaluating every agency and every right. program exactly. on how is what it's doing Right. Leading toward accomplishing they doing your plan. It? Are they they're doing not. It? They're not doing it's it. It's about how much did you get last time? Yeah. How much do you want this time? And let's get you something in between. Jeez. I mean, it, it really is amazing. But there is no strategic plan for Oregon. I mean, it's frustrating because you so much more could be done if you were not just looking at the politics involved mm -hmm. in passing a budget, but you were looking at what would actually benefit the state long term. Well, tell me this. It, it, what, who specifically is supposed to initiate this plan? I mean, is it the Ways and Means, or is it no, the governor? Or is the, it, the governor, the governor of every state is your chief executive, right? Right. And he's got, you know, a hundred people working for him in his budget departments. His, he's got thousands of people in Department of Administrative Services mm -hmm. and, and and others. So he has access, and so he is the executor of the 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 law, right. and also makes recommendations. The governor makes a recommendation of a budget. Mm -hmm. That before the Senate even convenes, okay. that that recommended budget comes out in December, and the the, the um, legislature convenes in January, and so that recommended budget basically says, here's where I think things are going, and here's how much money I think we're we're going to get, and here's how it ought to be spent, and that is the starting point for the legislature, okay. and then the legislature has kind of the oversight mm -hmm. responsibility, you know, passes the laws and makes sure that they're being implemented in a proper way. And the only real power that the legislature has is in the budget okay. because they can cut back on funds where things are not being spent well, that kind of thing. Is there enough time for the legislatures as opposed to the government who basically presents the supposed the budget plan? Do they have enough time to vet, if oh, you will, that particular? It's really challenging. Once you're in session, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Huh. I mean, you get there. <laughs> And you're in committee meetings every day. You've got lobbyists and special interests that want to meet with you, and they just stack yeah. up. And so every 15 minutes when you're not in a meeting uh, or, a co or in a committee, you will be meeting with people. And so from the time that you get there till the time that you go home, you are really, really busy. You know, I also do a newsletter that yeah. goes out to the whole state. Okay. And that newsletter, it, it's at DennisRichardson.org. Mm -hmm. That's my legislative website. Anyway, you can see the things I've written on, and it's go it, the goal of that as a legislature is to let people know all through the state what's happening in their state. And that way, th wherever they live, they can read something, because I link it to original documents, and they mm -hmm. can call their legislator then and say, where are you on the CRC, <laughs> you know, the Columbia mm -hmm. River Crossing, or where are you on PERS reform, mm -hmm. or where are you on this budget? And, uh, and 
and revenue on a tax increase. Are you for or against the tax increase? And so it makes all of us legislators accountable. It makes the governor accountable right, as well right, right, because right, right. when you have an informed electorate, right. they've got power. Exactly. They don't exactly. have any, it's, it's not a government of the people or by the people or for the people mm -hmm. if the people merely elect somebody and that person goes there and all they're hearing from are special interests and yeah, lobbyists right, 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 right. and it's yep, a yep. kind they've of got a, a system. No, they've got a plan. <laughs> they've got a plan and they're committed to it. <laughs> to their plan, that's right. That's legislators right. That's right. come and go, but the staffers and the lobbyists, they're there Wow. Forever. But the legislature, people who are elected to office by the people, are supposed to basically be representing us. They're they're our lobbyists, right? They are. Are they doing their job? What the, do you think? The people? Yes. I mean, well, the legislators who are representing. Oh, the, us. no. The le well, the legislators <laughs> are people. We're yeah. human beings, right? We're representing us. Okay. They're the electorate, right? What happens well. is, <laughs> you come from reality yes. into the capital and the the, the the buildings around it, where the okay. state's at. That's been described as one square mile surrounded by reality. <laughs> It's a different <laughs> world in the capital. That's, that's well. Know? That's well said. Put there. And everybody, everybody that's elected to office who has a vote is all of a sudden you've got hundreds of best friends. That's a representative. <laughs> how you doing, man? Maybe we got lunch together. And so, how about if we were to, uh, um, you know, maybe we can go golfing. Yes. Uh, and and oh, I need your help on this yeah. bill. And you know, it's about building relationships. Yes. You can't blame people like that. I mean, you don't have angry people as legislators. They're all really friendly kind of guys. And of course now when you get out of the legislature, all those best friends are gone. You know, you don't get a Christmas card after that. Um, but if you don't get there, elected again. If you don't get elected again, you're done and a new guy is the best friend. It, but that's just the way it is. And so hopefully you have people with maturity to know when it's just fawning and when it's insincere and you, you'll ask the right questions. But many legislators Many legislators are elected by special interests, yeah. and so they dance with the ones that brung them, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it is a, um, that is, it's almost incestuous when you've got a situation where the coalition of the status quo gets money and then spends it recruiting just the right mm -hmm. candidates mm -hmm. who are very mm -hmm. friendly to their mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying bribery or anything mm -hmm. like that, but they recruit the right people mm -hmm. who are really mm -hmm. friendly to them, mm -hmm. get them elected. And now they're in the legislature, and they protect the interests of those that help get hmm. them there. You know, I was just thinking, as, as a lay person, you know, I'm, lay, I'm getting ready to vote, right? And suppose that this person comes up to me and says, "Well, you should, you should elect me if you would vote for me because I've got a plan, mm -hmm. and the plan talks to some of the issues that you're concerned with." Mm -hmm. So then I vote for that particular person, thinking maybe that when they go down to the legislature, they will be, they, they can count, right? They supposed right. to be knowing That's how to right. count, right? And then when they go down there and say, "Well, okay, fine, I'm going to talk to you." Talk Look, I've got a heck of a plan. Does this identify with some of the other issues and whatever within the within mm -hmm. the state, mm -hmm. like mine? Because I got a job here to do. I represent these folks for my for the specific plan. Uh, does that does that resonate? I mean, am I am I saying you're the right? right. Thing? What you're saying is, isn't it true? Uh, maybe uh, here's what I'm thinking. Isn't yeah, it true right. that politics is a team sport? Yeah. And it is. You can't just go up there, though, with your plan and say, everybody, just accept it because I think this <laughs> exactly, is a good idea. Exactly. And so you've got to make sure you have a majority vote yeah. in the House and the Senate. Yes. And the way you do that is by developing relationships exactly. with the other legislators. Right. Exactly. And when they've got something that's important to them in their district that really doesn't affect you, it's not, everything is not a moral mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. then you help them out and they help you out. Uh, and that's why you have a caucus. A caucus is, is the, the team of your party. Let me mention something else people may uh -oh. not realize, and that is that extra vote. I mean, if, if you got 60 representatives in the House, right. and if you've got 31 of them that are Republicans or Democrats, right. and you've got 29 that is the other, that 31 is absolutely crucial. That majority, even though half the state right, right, is still right. there, 31. that majority gets to vote the first called the first vote they vote for the speaker and so they'll always vote with their party right and so if you have 31 democrats they will vote for a democrat speaker mm. and that speaker then will select primarily almost always from her party the the chairs of all the committees and then the speaker and the chairs decide which bills get hearings which bills never see oh, the light man. of day so it controls the whole outcome of the legislature so that first vote is really a big deal. And so that's why when people say, oh, my vote doesn't really count, they're absolutely wrong. We have districts that have been lost by under 300 votes. You know, and so 300 vote difference. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Ashland, Medford, the Senate 
there was a Senate fight last time between uh, Senator Bates, who's been mm -hmm. there a while, and a retired Marine colonel named da Dave Daughter. Mm -hmm. And Dave Daughter had never run for office before, but his last duty station was in the Pentagon as an analyst for the Secretary of the Navy. Uh -huh. Talk about a skill boy, set. Boy, hey. He had a hey, skill set. Hey, wow. He wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so he runs his campaign. He loses by 282 votes. If he had won, instead of the Senate being 16-14 with right. the Democrats in charge, it would have been a 15-15 split, and they would have had to get along, oh. and it would have changed the whole dynamics. Wow. So wow. 282 votes changed the whole control of the Oregon Senate. Wow. And so every vote does count. And when you... But basically, if you're a good legislator, you'll be working with people on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. It's not just about party. It, it's in, in Congress, it's that way. Mm -hmm. I talked to Suzanne Bonamici not yeah. too long ago, okay. and she's back in Congress. She said, Dennis, you can't believe how bad it is there. <laughs> says, when we go into a committee meeting, they got two doors. <laughs> And all of the Democrats walk through one door, and the Republicans walk through another Jeez. door. It's yeah. that separated. Yeah. Well, it's not that way in Oregon's House or Senate. You know, I mean, you know, you talk, you, you try and find areas of commonality and work together, mm -hmm. and there's going to be some bills that are going to be party well, well, let's say as a layperson, you know, I, I don't know that yeah. much about that. that. But the bottom line is that if 60 is the number, the, the, that's the magic number, right? Why don't we just maybe make it fair to begin with up front, say 30 Republicans and 30 Democrats. And so you have to work together. Well, because you're con and I'm hearing also I too, the, what lobbyists, you're the lobbyists meet you at the door when you get to the legislature anyway. If you have any kind of a plan, the lobbyists say, do you want to be here, right? You want to continue to be here? You know, what you're saying, it, it's like, it, it, in, <laughs> I think it's Nebraska that's the only state that has a unicameral um, legislature. In other words, okay. there, there's not, it's, it's not a Senate and Democrat, it's just one group. And, and they're supposed to decide everything. If you didn't have parties, you would still have coalitions. Okay, right. Because the, the lobbyists would then meet with everybody that's from the, co the coast because they want to do something in Coos Bay. Right. Maybe they want a pipeline. Right. And so they're going to meet with whoever might benefit or have some influence uh, that, that would be felt by the coast. Mm -hmm. And they would say, join with our coastal caucus because we need to make sure we have enough votes to win. Mm -hmm. They want 31 votes. They don't care which party they come from. <laughs> and so if there was if it was going to be required that to be 30-30, it would still get worked out wow. where wow. you'd be looking for wow. a majority. Wow, this is yeah. huge. This is huge. Well, look, look like we've been spending quite a bit of time. I've got about another minute or so that we can, before we take another break, aspect, break, break, take a break. And then what we'll do, we're going to come right back and, and start getting, giving us an update. You're giving us such an education <laughs> piece on the front end, which is good. I mean, because no background. Yeah. background, we need to, we needed to know that. That's, so that was a good, good session. So what I'm going to do now, uh, uh, we're going to take a short break. It might be a little shorter, but that'll give us a little bit more time. So you give us a little Absolutely. update on what happened in this past session. Absolutely. And talking about all those other goodies, okay? We'll take a short break, folks, and we'll be right back with Representative Dennis Richardson, okay? Oh, District okay. 4, Central Point. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Here we go. You're on. Go. Okay, folks, we're back again with uh, Representative Dennis Richardson. 
And, uh, and right up front with you, I, I hope you like the first part of the show because it gives you an idea of what goes on in the legislature. That was something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and I had the opportunity, so I figured let's go on and do it. Well, now what we're going to do, we're going to jump into something. As you know, uh, You Choose has always been our Speaker's Bureau uh, component, and uh, they basically provided uh, Representative Richardson with us today. And one of the main topics we want to kind of get into is the whole issue of PERS. PERS, which is a very, very serious situation. A lot of times, folks don't really know what's going on with PERS. All we do, we hear a lot of the media stuff, but the bottom line, what is PERS? And so we thought we'd take an, an opportunity to, to sit down with the, with, the, with the Representative Richardson here, and he'll give us a better feel of that deal. So I'm going to start off with, i got several questions here that I'm going to throw right on out again. Thanks for you, Choose, again, for giving us the opportunity to do this with, with Representative Richardson. Well, you know, for years there has been a, a great concern about the ongoing PERS crisis. Uh, Representative Richardson, how bad is it, and what will be its consequences in the future? What do you think? Okay. You know, for those that don't know, PERS yeah, yeah. is the Public is Employee Retirement System. Good. Okay. It is the retirement plan for almost all public officials from a water district, police departments, cities, counties, to the state. And so it's just one huge retirement plan. It's been going on for 40 to 50 years, and it's had different phases. And so that's important because the people that have been hired in the last 10 years or so are not, I mean, it's a, a more rational plan, and they're mm -hmm. not causing this PERS crisis. Mm -hmm. The PERS crisis that you hear about is the fact that there are benefits being paid and uh, to people that were hired before 1996. Before, so 1996, before okay. 1996 is called Tier 1 PERS. And for a Tier 1 PERS retiree who's been working for 30 years, when they got hired, the, the, they were promised that with Social Security, they get a retirement of 75 to 85% I mean, of, of their highest salary. Okay, and that, that was the PERS contract. That was okay, the deal. That was a contract. That was a deal. But what has happened, and I, I got in the legislature in 2003, and it was a huge problem then as where, well, and that is that you had people because of tweaks in the law, the way the stock market worked in the 1990s, um, changes by the legislature and the unions that, that they got through, which should never have happened, you had people retiring at more than 100% of their wages. I mean, I, when I was here in 03, I got a sheet from PERS that said that 30 years in, they were retiring at over 100%. Over 100%. Without Social Security. Social Security is about 30% of your wages. And so you have people retiring that when they got their Social Security added to it, it's 130% or Jesus. more. Some wow. people are getting 200%. That was rare, but it's a strange thing. So here you have a system where the state, for instance, take the, the state of Oregon, because it's the largest person employer, mm -hmm. it pays all the costs. The employees are supposed to pay 6%, but because of negotiations that took place in 1979. 1979. Who was governor then, if you don't mind? It was Vic Atia, Vic. And the deal was uh, there's inflation. We don't have the money to pay you uh, a, a pay increase. And so what we'll do is we'll pick up that 6%. The state will pay that for you. Hmm. Okay. And so, you know, all right, that's deal. That's in, in lieu of a pay increase. But two years later, in 1981, the unions came in and negotiated and they said, we haven't had a pay increase in four years. We need a pay increase. And so the pay increase over the next two years was 15.3% increase. And they didn't take away the PERS pickup. And so people say, well, that we earned that because that was in lieu of a pay increase. Well, yeah, except you got the pay increase two years later and you kept the 6%. So anyway, you, so you have a situation where the state is paying all the costs. And then you work un until age uh, say 30 years, you work for 30 years, and then because of a, a tweak in the system, it's called money match. And so what it means is during the 90s when you had all of this increase in, um, in revenue, the stock market was booming, the PERS board, which primarily had PERS members on it, would <laughs> allocate from all these stock increases money to their accounts, to all the PERS yes. accounts. Sometimes it was over 20% increase in one year. And so I, I went back and looked at it I don't want to get too technical, but I'm, yeah, this yeah, is background. Okay, yeah, sure, so in sure. the previous um, 18 years, there had been a, more than 8% given in like 15 of those 18 years. And so, and then to add insult to injury, if you have a bad year, mm -hmm. the guarantee is that you'd get 8%. 8%. Mm -hmm. 
So you get 8% return on your account in bad years and whatever was al allocated in the good years. It was heads, you win, so tails, sense we so lose. I mean, what, <laughs> I know, it's a pretty sweet Who's deal. Who's overseeing this stuff at the same time, other it's than the first be, board? It's supposed to be the legislature is okay. doing the oversight, but they're not paying attention to it. So the end result is people retiring, and they, they say, okay, I've got $300,000 in uh, my account. <laughs> it's because it's built up over the years. It's going to get doubled under money match. So now it's $600,000 in the account. And then they, the state does its calculations of what the annuity, the retirement annuity is going to be mm -hmm. based on an assumption of 8% a year. Well, 8%, Warren Buffett says, you know, that's absolutely incredible. It's never going to happen over time that you'll get that kind of money. You know, you will for periods, right, right, but right, not right, long term. Right. So anyway, you have, by doing it that way, you end up with a million dollar or higher annuity if you went out to buy it on the private market for a retirement plan for those tier one members that never put a dollar into it of their own. Hmm. Okay, I don't, I, I, we love our public servants and I believe that it's, a, it's to be expected. Anybody that's gonna retire is gonna take whatever yeah, is right. available exactly. to them. Right, I don't right, fault them right, at all. Right. It's the unions and the legislature which have allowed this to happen. Okay, so now you come forward to today, we have $14 billion hole. We have a, it's called an unfunded actuarial liability. Basically, it means with a retirement plan, you're supposed to have enough money to pay everybody their benefits. Right, exactly. Okay? And, and in Oregon, those benefits and that money is partially based, like 70% based on what the stock market does. So this huge PERS retirement plan is treated like a big mutual fund. Hmm. And so when things are going well, you don't yeah, charge yeah. the employers very much because you got all this money coming in. But when the market dumps, like it did in 2008, and you lose 20-some billion dollars from right. the fund, that money doesn't come back overnight, and so you have a hole. And that hole has to be made up by the employers. All right. All of that is background to where we're really at. What that means for employers, especially school districts and cities and counties and the state is, if you've got a $14 billion hole, that's like a mortgage and the employers have to pay that off over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so they do the calculations and they say to the school districts, guess what, you need to come up with $340 million as your share in the next two years of the payment toward PERS, toward this hole. Yes, okay. Where's that money gonna come from? Every school dis district gets their allotment and then they look at the number of people they have and they look at how much they're paying and 27% of payroll is going to go to PERS. Well, that means that if you have five teachers and they all are making, you know, roughly, you know, it's roughly $100,000 a year, including all the benefits. And if 27% if has to be added on to each of the first four of those teachers mm -hmm. to, to pay their PERS, that means that you can't hire that fifth teacher or you've got to lay them off or you lay that teacher off because you need the salary you were going to pay to the teacher in the classroom to make those PERS payments. And so you have places all across the state. One that comes to my mind is Beaverton. In the last two years, Beaverton laid off, last year, they laid off 344 teachers, hmm. cut five days off their school year, and added three to four kids to every classroom so that they could lay off, so that they could save enough money by laying off the teachers to make the PERS payments. I'm all for a good retirement plan, but there's something wrong here when you've got teachers that are making half of what the uh, of um of what is being paid to retirees because mm -hmm. they're settling for more than they made when mm -hmm. at the end of their career mm -hmm. and 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 then you have to lay off teachers to free up money to do that when the whole purpose of the school system is to help provide an excellent education right. for students exactly. Exactly. so anyway the system's broken mm -hmm. and you and and we started the last session with the goal of fixing PERS right. and providing jobs and economy, you know, helping our economy right. so that we could lower unemployment rate. At the end of the session, we did not fix PERS and we passed no bills that were really going to help raise or, or create a, an environment where jobs would be more plentiful. I mean, it's employers that create jobs, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, when they right. expand, yeah. they hire people. Mm -hmm. And when you say we're going to put more burdens on them, we're going to raise taxes on mm -hmm. them, they go someplace else mm -hmm. or they just don't invest. Mm -hmm. And so it means that we continue with unemployment rates that are higher than the national average mm -hmm. and have been since 1996. Mm -hmm. 
So anyway, with this PER situation, there was one bill passed. It was Senate Bill 822. Not a single Republican voted for it. Hmm. And we hmm. had over 30 other PERS bills that had been proposed. I included in proposing some. And not one hearing. We didn't get hearings on these bills, let alone a vote for them, because the, the Democrat Party controls the House and the Senate. The number one contributors to the Democrat Party are the public employer unions. Mm -hmm. And in 2003, I was in the legislature, and, there, uh, and I was the Republican that kind of became the go-to person on PERS. And then a friend of mine named Greg McPherson, an excellent attorney from Portland, a Democrat, became the go-to person from the Democrats. And he and I kind of led this whole battle on what we should do to fix PERS. He, for a number of reasons, I won't go into that right now, he ended up winning, although my bill made it out of committee, we put his down in the House, went, um, we had a vote, my bill made it through the, the House, went to the Senate, where my bill, the wording was gutted and stuffed and his was stuck in and it came back and ultimately mm -hmm. he gets his bill passed through. In the next election period, the next, the next year during elections, a Democrat is funded by the unions against McPherson in the primary and they take him out. And then later on he runs for attorney general and the money of the unions fund the campaign of his opponent. In other words, he was taken out of politics because he didn't play ball be, and what he did, it, they didn't go nearly far enough to fix PERS, and that's why we have a problem now. But what he did went beyond what the unions wanted, these public employee unions. Mm -hmm. And so they sent a signal to all the Democrat legislators saying, understand, you don't play ball with PERS by our rules, you're done. Wow. That's a, that is the reality. You won't hear that from anybody else, but I say it because it's the truth. Wow. Well, Dennis, you know, as I hear your piece, you, you, you made mention about the fact that you got employers, right? But the definitions of employers, and when it comes to PERS, are all government agencies, right? Oh, yeah. And all of these folks are on PERS. <laughs> Talk about I, that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, okay. are you're, they not? They're absolutely right. I mean, from, from a futuristic standpoint, they're going to be basically looking at the same retirement system. So, Yeah, yeah. people say I'm anti-union. My, my dad was, <laughs> was born in the wool. In the wool. Uh, he was tried and true right. uh, carpenter union right. in Los Angeles. When I was young, I did some apprenticing in the L.A. Carpenters Union. Uh, and, but with unions, you have capital, meaning the guys with the money, right, the right. employers, and you have labor. Right. And so they negotiate, and there's this natural tension because labor would like to get money to shareholders and keep their money, and labor, I mean, the capital does, and labor would like to get as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And so you have that natural tension, and they work it out. When it's public employee unions... It's the people that pay, exactly, exactly. and they're not at the table exactly. negotiating. That's right. That's exactly. And so you have negotiators who have no skin in the game, mm -hmm. and except that they don't want to strike mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that make them look bad mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know jeopardize mm -hmm. their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, the unions get what they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they ask for the moon, and they get you know something less. Mm -hmm. But it's always more. There's never any real strong resistance because there's no natural tension there. And so you have this incestuous situation that is hurting our state. Uh, there was a comment made in 2007 when the, the Democrats took over. It was primarily, they, they won uh, from the Republicans, which you know goes back and forth. And uh, one of the lobbyists from the OEA, the teachers union, was heard to go through the house saying, this is the house the OEA built. Oh, I mean, that guy, and these people, they get paid big money. I mean, these yeah. lobbyists for yeah. these unions oh, yeah. are making, oh, yeah. you know, oh, six yeah. digits, oh, yes. right? Yes. As yes. they represent people that may be making 10 to $15 an hour if they're uh, doing in-home care. Mm -hmm. And so they, they have a job to do, and they do their job for their members. But by golly, it's not for the, 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 the taxpayers or the citizens in education. It's not for the kids. They say do this, it's for the kids, raise these taxes, it's for the kids, and then it all goes to their union members. Somebody once asked one of the, their leaders, when are you going to actually represent the kids and take care of the kids like you say? Mm -hmm. Well, when they have a union car course. Jeez. I mean, is it, yeah. you know, I don't fault people for doing what they say they're going to do. I mean, they, they represent their members, but it's when they say we're doing this to ki for the kids or mm -hmm. for the seniors mm -hmm. and all that, that's just marketing, wow, wow. that's propaganda.
follow the money, watch where it's follow really going, exactly. and then you'll see what's exactly. really happening in our state. You know, you made another point from the standpoint, Social Security is about 30% in only retirement. That's what folks will be looking at. Now, all of a sudden, it is, now they're getting over 100% with this PERS concept, with the, the addition, right? And are guaranteed to get 100% plus, right? Mm -hmm. What percentage, if you will, of the folks who are retiring in PERS are getting that 100%? Any idea? Um, Any thought? I, you know, I don't have that on top of my mind. But a number. It, it, it requires, well, it's, it's tens of thousands. Yes, right. And these are the people that have been there for 30, 30 years. years right, most right. people come and leave. You yeah, know, right, right. Most, they, they, most people are not career. The reason we use that 30-year figure is because we have the numbers for that. And when I said it was, it was over 100% in 2003, because of changes we made in 2003, over time, the, that number has gone down to about 79% plus the 30 percent for social security Jeez. so when you put social security back in there you're still over 100 mm -hmm. percent mm -hmm. and then when you add to it that the number that that pension calculation is based on the final average salary but that's not your salary it's the final average best money you ever made and you can spike it you can include overtime bonuses vacation time, uh, sick leave, un I mean, all of these things, and, and there's been some changes in that, but basically all of those extra things ha in the past have been used to pad the last three years so that the annuity will be based on this inflated number. One's national statistics said that it can increase the amount of retirement by as much as 40% by spiking. Well, we could change that. That's not part of the PERS contract, mm -hmm. and the state allows that to happen. Some districts don't, but most of the people in, that are getting PERS are allowed to spike. We should make changes. We should honor the contract, mm -hmm. but we should do those things that the legislature has the ability to do that will save money. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of things that we can do that could help solve this crisis mm -hmm. so that we don't skim so much off of the budgets that require laying off teachers, mm -hmm. laying off police mm -hmm. and fire and, uh, and, and our closing down our library systems and all of the other things that have to be done to save money so that you can make these exorbitant payments. Mm -hmm. to, to well, you know, uh, the other thing that comes to mind is that um, it has been said that Governor Kitzhopper, if you will, has a plan, if you will, that he'd like to introduce by bringing the legislation back for a special session. You want to talk to that? Is there, is there a plan? Is there, have you seen the plan? Now, have no, you seen the, the plan? I have not seen the current plan. <laughs> I've seen the plan before. That he's proposing, maybe? Understand, we had a six-month session, essentially. Right. And we couldn't fix PERS in six months. And so now we've been out for two and a half, three months. Nothing's changed. No, there's, been no, there, there's been no change in the economy or anything else. There's been no breakthroughs. It's the idea of let's go back in and see if we can raise taxes. The, the, the deal, the grand bargain that they're talking about includes uh, chain tweaking per a little bit that affects your retirees. It's not gonna fix it. You know, it's not going to solve the PERS problem. But I thought that was what the whole purpose of the, well, this session. That's what they say, but it's not about the words. It's about the money. The money. Follow, Follow the, money. the money. Follow the money. You know, I said that there was one, one uh, PERS bill that was passed, the mm -hmm. Senate Bill 822, mm -hmm. and I said there's not a single Republican that voted for it. The reason none of us would vote for it is it didn't fix it. It was meant to just impress people. They say, wow. look what we've done. Wow. One of its provisions in a budget note, but it's part of this bill, was just don't pay $350 million of a PERS payment in the next two years. Just, it's like a, your credit card, they, they send you a little notice in December saying, yeah. don't make a payment. Yeah. December, take a little holiday and just <laughs> add it to the end of the bill. And of course, we're gonna have a lot of interest on yeah, that. Yeah, right, right, right. It's a $350 million holiday payment, or you know, holiday from payments that then starts getting paid over 20 years. I brought out in one of my newsletters that the cost of not making that $350 million payment in the next two years will be a billion dollars to taxpayers. You're losing a half a billion dollars in investment proceeds you would have gotten by making it, and you're paying a half a billion dollars in additional interest on payments on this $350 million over time. That's the kind of budgeting attitude right, right. that we have representing us. And, and, and so it's a challenge being in the legislature where you have those kinds of decisions being made, and all you can do is talk about it, try and point it out, but it's like getting through the next two years. It's not about long-term plan. So if we get back into special session, there may be a tweak to try and fix that because they're getting kind of embarrassed. 
over what they've done when well, people find out about well, it. Well, we got people like you, but I'm thinking about, well, who's really representing the people of Oregon who's picking up the bill? I mean, in all due respect, we are concerned about our kids, the education of our kids, right? right. I mean, the crowdedness, all this, this, that, and the other. And the other thing that comes to mind is that when I think about media, I mean, we got basically one newspaper in the state of Oregon, that is the Oregonian, so to speak. Yeah. They've got they've got all sorts of people sitting at the, at the table, analysts and investigative reportings and whatever. Are they doing a pretty good job in terms of educating the public and also educating the, the state that we're in at this point in time? We represent the purge. I, I get I Oregon. give credit where credit's due, and I think the Oregonian on PERS has done a, a, a very admirable do job in the last couple of years. They've had a number of articles where they've laid out the, what the facts are, okay. and they, they call me. I talk to them about it. They say, you know, what do you think about this? They call okay. all around to try and make sure that they're not missing anything, right. and so I think that they've done a pretty good job on PERS. Uh, the, it, on budgeting, it's a different issue because they don't emphasize enough that we've got 13% increase in revenue, mm -hmm. that's $2 billion, mm -hmm. $2 billion mm -hmm. dollars of more revenue in the next two years than we had the last two years, and the governor wants us to go back into special session to raise taxes? Hmm. What is that about? Wow. There's never enough money for those that don't have to earn it. Hmm. They don't produce. Hmm. I, I don't know all the history of our leadership now, but I don't think that any of them have really ever signed the front of a business check. Wow. I mean, I've done that, oh, yeah. yes. and and so I've gone without getting paid myself because I had to make sure my employees exactly. got paid. Exactly. I understand you have to produce something right. to right. make a profit right. to right. pay taxes on right. it, right. and yet the idea will just raise taxes and somehow we'll do more good right. with other people's money. Right. Right. That's the kind of attitude that drives business away from Oregon, right, right, right. that keeps us with high unemployment, mm -hmm. that keeps us taking money from education, and our statistics and our, our achievements are dropping. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see this article in the Oregonian just later or earlier this or just last week, 20% drop in achievement just in exactly. some of the school districts. And especially here in the, in the Portland Metro area. We oh. are failing our students. Yes, yes. We're failing the next yes, generation. Yes. They yeah. cannot compete in a 21st global market yes. if they're 42nd to 46th in our nation, mm -hmm. and our nation's behind Bulgaria mm -hmm. in math mm -hmm. and science. Wow. I mean, that's what I recently wow. saw. We cannot continue this. We need to learn from the past, get back the pioneer spirit that we've mm -hmm. had anciently mm -hmm. of opera, you know, earlier from yeah. opportunity and all yeah. of these things, and, and change the course of our mm -hmm. state. And we have the ability. That's why we elect people to do that. Why don't you take three minutes and kind of give us a sense of what are the Republicans, if in fact there's a special session aspect mm -hmm. of it, what about the Republicans? Do they have a plan from the standpoint of a solution to the deal? Any, any, give us a little yeah. thought about that. The, the challenge for the Republicans right now is we're in the minority. Right, and right. so we had many bills that would have helped solve the problems on jobs and on PERS and on the economy. None of them got heard. Give us an no, example okay. of what, what you one pick one that, that might that you can share with the public. Okay, uh, on on PERS, uh, if we were to uh, take the six percent that the employee is supposed to be paying, and presently, uh, since two thousand and three, we're treating them like a a separate retirement plan. Okay. We have the standard; it's called a defined benefit plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then that six percent goes into a separate account called account called an IAP, and it just accumulates there like a defined a contribution plan and when a guy retires or a person retires they get their defined benefit plan plus they get the money that's accumulated over here mm -hmm. that six percent was intended to fund the defined benefit plan and so if it went into the the, the PERS system I mean it, it was allocated in a separate account for the PERS member but it was part of their benefit plan it would have saved seven hundred and twenty five million dollars mm. in the next two years in in 2013 to 15 that $725 million would have been able to be used to hire teachers instead of firing them, to shrink down the class sizes a little bit instead of expanding them, and to have a longer educational period, mm -hmm. you know, number, extra days. $22 million buys one day of school statewide. So $220 million will increase your school year by two weeks, you know, two, mm -hmm. five days, you know, 10 school mm -hmm. days. We could have done that. We had the ability, we had the knowledge we didn't have the votes because it would have affected the unions and they're unwilling to do that which is needed knowing that we have a crisis in PERS but they cannot allow it to be solved because it would have an effect on on everybody mm -hmm. and not you can't just say just on the people that are already retired right 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 so where do we go from here what do you think 
If, if you don't have the session, what, yeah. what, what well, impact will we have in it? If we have a session, it's going to be to basically give the, the governor one more chance to try to and try get it. enough votes to get through a tax increase that we don't need, yeah. to tweak PERS without fixing it, or to uh, try and go the, the CRC, the Columbia River Crossing, mm -hmm. without Washington picking up half the freight, mm -hmm. and, and, and do this without getting their permission to actually okay. connect the bid, the bid, the bridge to their yeah, side and down. to build a bridge that's not high enough for even the current freight that goes under it. The bridge is going to last 100 years and it's already going to be obsolescent and you're going to have to pay, we have to pay $84 million to three or four companies upriver because they're going to lose that money because they can't get their products yeah, under yeah, the yeah, new bridge. Yeah, right, right. Anyway, huge problem. So if we don't have the session, nothing's affected. If we do have it, we don't see how that's going to really help. Wow. But what we need to do is have the people become more engaged. Mm -hmm. They need to know what's happening. They need to ask themselves, are we better off now than we were in the, in the past? And make decisions on who represents them based on what they think is better for the future. Mm -hmm. And I, we all have to get engaged. We exactly. cannot continue exactly. Exactly. to just trust that things are going to get better mm -hmm. when we have no plan, no strategic plan to change things. You know, you've educated the voter here today, and then too often that's ten, that basically was lacking within our community, if you will, across the board for that. Many Oregonians don't know anything. Uh, the only thing they know is that when, when election time comes around, they get flyers, they that's get all right. kinds of goodies, and, you know, but again, follow the money aspect of, it, aspect of it. But you've given us really an opportunity to really see something that, as far as I'm concerned, that, that has a major interest because we're paying for it. You know a saying? government the of the people, by the people, by the people right. means that the people are participating exactly. and for the people means that they're holding their representatives accountable exactly. to make sure that the decisions are for the exactly. benefit of the exactly. people. Exactly. That requires an informed electorate. Yeah. So we all, we owe it to the next generation to know a little bit more about what's going on and to make sure that we're a part of the solution instead of just sitting on the sidelines and taking whatever comes down. Oh, Dennis, you, you've, you've really been really, it's an enlightenment. We want to thank you very much for being with us, Dennis. I mean, it's been great. And first of all, again, thanks for serving too, by the way. You too, Appreciate sir. that very much. We got to have you back here. I would enjoy yeah, that. Because that thank CRC you. is another issue. Because the first thing I'm going to ask you out of the block, you could take, I mean, I, I remember that list that was in the Oregonian talking about that $170 million. Mm -hmm. You think we might be able to get some of that money back from some of those recipients? <laughs> Unlikely. The real question is, are we going to end up having to pay some of that back because it didn't go toward getting an agreement from exactly. two states? Exactly. That's not even answered oh, yet. Oh, gee whiz, Dan. Well, Dennis, thanks very much. But I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. you got to come back here, okay? Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Again, Representative Dennis Richardson. Remember that name, okay? Again, I'm Bruce Broussard. Have a good one. I'll see you a little later. We'll talk about it next week. Thanks again, you choose. <laughs>